would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure being, great pleasure being here, in particular with this nice weather and the beautiful flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to give some introductory introduction into Brillenöter theory of vector bundles. To start with, of course, I should repeat Brillenöter theory of line bundles. So the first section, or maybe, yeah, is Brillenöter, which I abbreviate like yeah, Brillenöter theory of line bundles. Let me start with a 19th century problem. So let x be a smooth, I mean no, compact Riemann surface. or if you wish a smooth projective curve, but uh, in the 19th century one probably looked more at compact Riemann surfaces, of genus, of genus G greater or equal to 2. Right, then a divisor on X is a formal sum D uh, of points P and integers PI, and the sum should be finite. So where N, P are integers and uh, P are points in X, and this is the finite sum which is indicated by the uh, prime there. Then one could, uh, considers the following vector space. This is the space of all Merovic functions of X into C such that, yeah, well, such that to every function you can associate a divisor, which I denote by f in brackets, which is the sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles, right? And uh, then you add d, and this is supposed to be effective, meaning that all the integers are non-negative, right? This is a finite dimensional vector space, so vector space or finite dimension, I don't write it, right? And then in one considered in the 19th century the corresponding projective space. So this is P of L of D. This is a projective space and the famous, so let me see, uh, this is what uh, one nowadays calls and what one also in that uh, period called a linear system. And the Brillenöter problem consisted in computing the dimension of this vector space. So, dimension of, uh, of this, sorry, projective space. Dimension of this. What is the dimension of this projective space? It's always finite that one knows, okay? Let me recall some, two classical results. First, this is the famous theorem of Riemann-Roch, which I also abbreviate Riemann-Roch theorem which says that the dimension of this projective space minus the dimension of the projective space, if I take a, a canonical divisor, which is a div uh, some divisor of a holomorphic function or a meromorphic function, if you wish, minus d, then this is always the degree of the divisor, which is the sum of the n p plus 1 minus g. And the second classical theorem is the theorem of Clifford. So Clifford's theorem. And this says that if the degree of d is positive, is non-negative, so if d is effective, and moreover the linear system here k minus d is non-empty, then dimension of d is less or equal to the degree of d over 2. These are the two famous classical results. Now let's come to 20th century. One looked at this problem in a little, little different way. First of all, I mean, this is not so important, but one, it's convenient to replace d by the 
reinwandeln. Das ist ja auch schädlich im Moment. Okay? You place this by a line bundle and then consider moduli spaces of line bundles. Okay? And that D be the degree of the line bundle and this is by definition the degree of the divisor D. Then we consider the moduli space of all those line bundles of degree D which is the Picard variety of degree D. Right? So this is space of all line bundles of degree D modulo isomorphism. This uh, forms an algebraic variety, in fact it is an, if you fix a point then this is an abelian variety of dimension G. Abelian, but I don't need this. Right. Of dimension the genus of the curve, right? And moreover, if one translate the dimension of this vector space, this is now in dimension of the H0 of the line bundle L, this is dimension of L of D, this vector space. Okay, then one introduces the following problem, space, subspace here of the Picard variety, maybe I go over there again. So this is the space V, uh, the, sorry, W, K minus 1 of X. This is by definition the subspace of all subset, first of all, of all subset of pick D of X, of all line bundles in pick D of X, such that H0 of L is greater or equal to K. So it's a subset in peak D of X. Right? And this is called the Bernoulli locus. Uh, it's not too difficult to see, and we will uh, later I will give a proof in the more general case of vector bundles that this is a de determinantal variety. Okay, and the fact that it is a determinantal variety has consequences. So from the theory of the determinantal varieties, uh, we get that uh, every, that in fact this is a variety, uh, well, um, algebraic set, first of all, right? It need not be uh, irreducible, but it's an algebraic set. And uh, what, from the fact that it is a determinantal variety, we get that every, component, every irreducible component of W, D, K minus 1 of X has dimension <coughs> greater or equal to some number, which is generally denoted by beta D comma K, which is defined to be G minus K times K minus D plus G minus 1, and which is called the Brenner number. I will explain this with proofs later for vector bundles because, uh, and the proof, then the, the proof of that will be, I mean, of this is a special case of proof later. Okay, moreover, another thing we need, which is the Petri map. So it, an infinitesimal study of this variety leads to the Petri map. And also we will see this later how this works. Right? This is the following map, we call it mu H0 of L. Let's call it mu L maybe because it depends on L. H0 of L, H0 of K tensor L minus tensor L minus 1. And well, if you have two sections here, you can multiply them, you get a section of H0 of K. Right? This is just tensorizing the two sections. You get a section of L tensor K tensor L to the minus 1, which is K. Okay? 
and the fact. Yeah, then one can show, then one can show, and we will see this, I hope uh, we have time to do this, that the Tsarisky tangent space at the point L of the variety V d k minus 1 of x at the point L is just the co-kernel of this map and then the dual of it, I mean, the co-kernel is a vector space, the dual vector space is just the, yeah, just the dual vector space, homomorphisms of this into the base field, I mean, here it's complex numbers of you wish. Okay, this is the tangent space. And uh, one, yeah, one from this, actually, one gets immediately that, uh, that W, D, K minus 1 of X, is smooth of dimension of the expected dimension, the Bernoulli number, smooth, smooth variety of dimension beta dk, if and only if, if and only if the petro, uh, mu is injective. <coughs> And H0 of L is equal to K. So the line bundles with this have a special property, and the curve is called a Petri curve if this is the case for every line bundle. Mm -hmm. <coughs> X is a Petri curve. Definition, if and only if mu injective for all L in X on X. And then one knows that actually if X is general curve in some sense, right, general, I will not explain this, a general curve, then X is a pet. Uh, sorry, if uh, X is petri, then X is, if X is. Petri, then X is general. So X is a general in the sense of Renaultus. Yeah, I will not explain this. General. Okay. And so let me recall now the main results of classical Renaultus theory of line bundles, which you all find in the book Albarero, Cornell, and Griffiths Harris. And let me recall it because later I want to go on to vector bundles and say what are the analogous results. So results, I write them here because I would like to make a comparison to later. Right? Or results of classical Bernoulli theory. So maybe like that. Okay, first of all, if this Brunner number dk is greater or equal to zero, then the Brunner locus is always non-empty. W d k minus one. K minus one here writes because k minus one. This is a classical uh, description. K minus one is the dimension of the corresponding projective space. Right. <coughs> I will come to this later. Okay. Then this is non-empty. This comes from the determinant of variety theory. Okay. Second, if it is positive, then uh, the Brunner locus is even connected. Okay. This is the. Uh, Fulton Lazarus for connectedness theory is by no means uh, trivial. Or so, but, uh, just, okay. Third, if X is a Petri curve, then if the Bernoulli theory, uh, the Bernoulli number, is smaller than zero, then the con conversely the Bernoulli locus is empty. Then W D k minus 1 of x is empty. 
the fourth property. If x is Petri again, and then if beta, the Brunetta number, bk, is greater or equal to zero, then we have that the dimension of the Brunetta locus is actually equal to the uh, Brunetta number, then dimension w d k minus 1 of x is equal to beta d k. And moreover, one knows about the singularities. The singularities are exactly w d k plus k of x. Uh, they are exactly those Lanmans which have one more section. Right. So this is sing singularities of d d w k minus 1 of x are exactly are exactly w d k of x. Those line bundles which have k plus 1 sections. Okay? The fifth property, again, if x is happy, then if the Brunetta number d k is positive, then one knows even that the Brunetta locus is irreducible. This was uh, proven by Zavieri with a proof with a gap, and then later by Griffiths Harris uh, and other people in the 70s or 80s. I don't remember. If this is positive, then W D K minus one is actually irreducible. And six. If we take, if we define g uh, d k minus one of x to be the blow up of the singularities, so this is the blow up of w d k minus one of x along the singularities. Think of w d k minus 1 of x, right, then the support of this d k minus 1 of x can be described as a set of linear systems, L w, Lv say with L in P, uh, d of x and uh, V in the Grassmannian of uh, k plus one dimensional subspaces of H zero of L. Okay. Yeah. So this is just, in other words, is G D k minus one of X parametrizes linear systems of that degree. Okay, so let me write this hence. Uh, G D k minus one of X parameterizes linear systems of dimension k minus 1 and degree d on x. So the linear system are just a blow up of the singularities in this case. Right? And the point I would like to make is that all of this is wrong for vector bundles. I would like to give counterexamples. All of this is wrong here, except two where one doesn't know. The proof at least, well, I will come to this later, the proof doesn't work uh, for rank, higher rank vector bundles, but for every other uh, of the statements, I will give a counterexample. Before this, of course, I have to explain the Brunetta theory for vector bundles. So, second section, Brunetta problem for vector bundles. All on, on the curve. X is always the curve, the given curve. Okay. So we consider in 
the same way as, as before. Now the set of vector bundles of rank, say, n greater or equal to 2, or n equal greater or equal to 1, if you wish, 1 was the case uh, right now, with h0 of e greater or equal to k, as is the same uh, as for line bundles. Okay? And we want to consider this again as an algebraic variety, as some sort of algebraic variety. So the first problem we have is, uh, so we have to consider moduli spaces here. The first problem we have is that there are several notions of moduli spaces here. Right? If you consider all vector bundles of this type, of uh, all vector bundles of rank n and a given degree, I didn't write down the degree actually here, degree equal to d, degree e equal to d, then they don't form an algebraic variety but some more general object which is uh, uh, called an algebraic stack, uh, which is not an algebraic variety but a more general object. Uh, fortunately, well, uh, but then it also con uh, the corresponding stack also contains uh, direct sum of line bundles where one of the line bundles has arbitrarily high degree, right, because the others can have smaller degree. This means that uh, the the H, that this set can be arbitrarily large because uh, we, you get with one line bundle you get can get, go arbitrarily high. So this for this uh, for the stack of uh, vector bundles this doesn't make the problem doesn't make sense to consider this here, right? Because it's always non empty. So we have to restrict our notions of vector bundles, and the right notion was uh, introduced by Mumford, uh, the notion of stability. If you consider stable vector bundles, then uh, or semi-stable vector bundles, then you may uh, you get uh, reasonable moduli spaces which generalize, in some sense, the Pika variety. For this, I have to define now what is a stable vector bundle. So a vector bundle E is called rank n in degree d. I mean, is called stable if and only if for every proper subbundle. f of e, we have the following inequality. I mean, the vector bundle always has a degree, as a degree, also f is a vector bundle, as a degree, the degree is just the degree of the determinant bundle, so the degree of the corresponding line bundle, and it has a rank. And we consider the quotient, and the definition is just this has to be smaller than the degree of e divided by the rank. Right? And it's called semi-stable if and only if, again for the same here, for all proper subbundle f, we have here that this is lesser equal to. So degree f by divided by rank f is lesser equal to the degree f, degree e divided by rank e. And then using this notion here, Mumford constructed a moduli space. He showed that the stable vector bundles of a, of a given degree and a given rank form an algebraic variety, which is called the moduli space, m of n, d. This is, by definition, the set of E stable, such that rank of E is n, and degree of E is d. modulo isomorphism. He showed that this is an algebraic variety of dimension, smooth variety of dimension of dimension smooth of dimension which is uh, n squared times g minus 1 plus 1. So if g is 1, you have here g minus 1 plus 1, which is g, and you get back the p variety. Right. And then later, uh, Seshadri, I mean, this is in general not a projective variety. Seshadri projectivized this by considering just m tilde of n, d, set of e semi-stable. with the same rank and the same degree, but not the same isomorphism 
relation, not the same equivalence relation. Here uh, you need, a, well, I write it like this, need a more uh, a coarser notion, namely uh, every semi-stable you can uh, you can find a, a, how do you call this uh, filtration such that the the, 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 the the graded quotients are vector bundles, and in such a way that all the graded quotients are stable, and uh, the uh, notion equivalence here is so-called Sechadri equivalence, which means or S equivalence, which means that the graded objects are isomorphic, right? Which is so there may be isomorphic and non-isomorphic semi-stable bundles which are isomorphic, but then it turns out that this is uh, is projective irreducible. Projective irreducible uh, with M. I mean, I abbreviate this by M and this by M tilde. With M open and dense. <coughs> M in M tilde open dense. Okay? So it's a compactification of this modular space. Right? Uh, yeah, so these are the two modular spaces with which are the basis for the Bernoulli theory for vector bundles. And for simplicity, just for this talk, I mean, there is a Bernoulli theory for this and for this, for both of them. For simplicity, for this talk, I just consider M, right? Because the results are similar, not the same, but similar for semi stable bundles, right? So for simplicity, only modular space of stable bundles. Then one makes the definition in the same way as before, and now one denotes it by B and D, and then K, I will say just in a minute, Y, K, M, and D, such that H0 of E is greater than equal to K. Right? This is the real neutral locus uh, for vector bundles here for stable vector bundles. There is a similar, as I said, a similar Brillouter locus for semi-stable, but just for simplicity I will only consider this. In classical notion this would, would be called dk k minus 1 of x, or I omit the x, x is fixed in it, right? Uh, here one, uh, because here one considered, one, one considered the projective dimension, but it doesn't really make sense for vector bundles. Uh, projective, I mean, you had the linear system which embed the, or, or give a morphism or rational map of the curve into projective space. Here it goes into Grassmannian, the corresponding morphism, and the Grassmannian is not, well, it's a projective variety, but not, uh, some sense, it parametrizes sub-vector spaces, right? So it doesn't really make sense. Uh, to uh, write here k minus 1, so we make uh, do this notion here, k, instead of k minus 1. So then, well, the first thing we have to do is uh, introduce a scheme structure. This is only a set, right? So first of all, scheme structure on b and d k. Right, and I will give the proof here since this is a course for graduate students supposed to be. Uh, I give the proof of this, more or less. First of all, we need some, again, some uh, basic theorem. So for Riemann Roch, there's also Riemann Roch for vector bundles, which says the following if F is coherent chief of rank N and degree D degree D on X degree D on X then Riemann Roch says that H0 of F minus H1 of F is actually equal to the degree minus N rank times G minus 1 so it's almost the same as for line bundles. Uh, there was a, a rank 1 here, then you have Riemann Roch for line bundles. Now for the corresponding vector space and not for the projective spaces, which I wrote down before. And then one has a cell duality. F is coherent on X. 
you have that h1 of f is equal to h0 of uh, kx. kx is now the canonical line bundle tensor f dual. The dual line bundle is a line, uh, the vector bundle of homomorphisms of, uh, onto the trivial bundle. And then we have to dualize here to get an isomorphism. So it looks the same way. So this means false. This is cell duality. What else do we know? Some notions, maybe. This degree of E divided by the rank of E is called the slope of E. Turns out that this is an important notion and uh, the abbreviation makes sense. So then what is the range of uh, where we consider, what is the range of degrees where we consider this? So if E is semi-stable with mu of E less than zero, this means of course that the degree is less than zero, then H0 is zero. Right? Because if, if it would not be zero, <coughs> you would have a morphism from <coughs> Ox to E, non-trivial, and you could fill it up to a sub-bundle and get a contradiction to this here. <coughs> right? Then from cell duality we get <coughs> we get that if mu of E is greater than 2G minus 2, right, then H1 is zero. This comes from cell duality. Because if you take the cell dual, this has then mu less than zero. Okay. And this implies that slope from this it follows that if mu of e is greater than 2g minus 1, we had this for line bundles uh, just in the talk before, then e is generated by sections, by global sections, is generated by, I mean I say generated in general, and but it's of course generated by h0 of e. Why does this come? Maybe I should give an Now you are always considering semi-stable. No? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Semi-stable bundle. I forgot here. Right. Right. Uh, here also. Yeah, same. Same. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not true. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's generated. We, why is it generated? Since you always have an exact sequence. So zero e of minus x or any point x in, in the curve may embed into E, and this goes into E restricted, or 2x, 0, right? So you just take Ox of minus x into Ox into the restriction O on the, on the fiber here, and tensorize with the vector bundle E. Get this exact sequence, and then, uh, yeah, one is, uh, then you know from, from this here that mu, if mu of E is greater than 2g minus 1, then mu of E of minus x, you will subtract a point, is greater than 2g, sorry, 2g, uh, greater than 2g minus 2, and then h1 is 0, h1 of this is 0 always, so this is always surjective on sections, right? This is what we need. Okay? So, this is the basics. Now we can construct the scheme. So for n, it's fixed. Now we fix nd. Fixed. Then we choose a divisor, effective divisor, so sum of points of degree of degree delta very large. Right, so that we come with a vector bundle in this range there. Right. It doesn't matter which one, we just take one. We'll see this later. Then, then we have an exact sequence. 
well, E of now let me start slowly. O X and then here O restricted to D. Okay, we tensorize this by E, by the vector bundle E. Since this is a vector bundle, this stays exact. So we get E, and this we call E of D, which is an abbreviation. Maybe I should write this down here. E of D is an abbreviation for E tensor O X of D. Okay, just write E of D for this. And then here, this goes to, yeah, E restricted to D. Right? Taking global sections, we get when we take global sections, we get H zero of E goes to H zero of E of D goes to H zero of E restricted to D goes to H1 of E. Okay? Goes to zero. Because, because we to this has a very large degree, because the divisor D had very large degree, so H1 of this vanishes. Okay? So hence, so I call this map I call phi E. Right? Now what we get is that this H0 is I mean, the dimension of this is greater or equal to k. So h0 of e, my h0 of e, I mean, the dimension of this, is greater or equal to k if and only if this map has rank, this dimension of this, minus k. Okay? So this if and only if rank uh, of phi e is less or equal to h0 of e of d minus k. Okay, and then by Riemann-Roch we know the H0 here because we know the H1 and we have this Riemann-Roch theorem. So by Riemann-Roch, Riemann-Roch, we get here, this is, well, maybe I write it here, this is D plus N delta. Yeah, I did not say, I mean, there's a formula. If you have a vector bundle and a line bundle and take the tensor product, then the degree of the tensor product is the degree of this plus rank times the degree of the line bundle, right? So this is just a formula here. So we get this here. Minus n times g minus 1 minus k. This is the minus k from here. And this is just uh, h0, right? So this we always have, we know how to, when this is greater or equal to 0, okay? And then the next step is to globalize this. This works for every vector bundle, semi-stable vector bundle of rank n and degree d, and we uh, can put them together, globalize this, right, to get a sequence of vector bundles, actually. So this can be globalized. <coughs> Meaning the following? Well, for simplicity, we assume, for simplicity, Assume. I mean, the proof works also if it's not a greatest common divisor, greatest common divisor, greatest common divisor G, common divisor of uh, uh, N and D. The rank and degree is one. The proof works also in the other case, but here in this point, one has a so-called Poincaré bundle, as in the case of uh, curves, which one doesn't have if the uh, greatest if they have. Uh, common divisor here, right? So when there exists a common uh, Poincaré bundle, then in the other cases it works the same, it's a little bit more difficult, but I, I, use, I prefer to use this Poincaré bundle. P on X cross M. M is the modular space. What does it mean? I.e. This means that if you have a, I mean, this is a bundle on this product here. If you restrict to a point, and the, 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 the points here of M represent the vector bundles. If you restrict to a point, you get just the vector bundle, okay? So P restricted to X cross 
and the point is just a vector bundle. Here is represented by a vector bundle, right? And this is just E. This means there is a Poincaré bundle. This doesn't exist for if, the, uh, if there is a common divisor, but one uh, can get out of this uh, with no, not much difficulty. Then we consider the corresponding exact sequence here. What is this? This is just now 0, O, X cross M, P1 upper star, O, X of D, with always the same D, right? And then you have here P1 upper star, O, D of D, 0, right? This is the analog of this, the globalization of this exact sequence, right? P1 is the projection. Right, so for every point, if you restrict to any point here, x cross any point, you get this exact sequence. Okay, and this again you can tensorize with the Poincaré bundle. So tensorizing with the Poincaré bundle, we get zero. Here we get the Poincaré bundle, and here we get p. And now I have to write it like this. You cannot make this abbreviation here, I mean, because we have the project projection here. And the same here, P tensor with P1 upper star OD of D goes to zero. I mean, since P is a vector bundle, this stays exact, okay? And then we do the same thing as we did here, taking global sections. What, what does it mean? We don't take global sections, but we take P1, P2 lower star, right? Now we take P2 lower star, because this is also a left exact factor, so we get from this we get taking not global sections but partly global sections we get uh, zero p2 lower star of p uh, p2 lower star of p tensor p1 upper star o x of d and then next is p2 lower star p tensor p1 upper star uh, o d of d and actually, we don't need the next one because we didn't need it here also. Actually, here we didn't, we didn't need this one, right? Okay, so this is the map phi. And for if you restrict this to a point, to x cross a point, E, you get this one. You get this one, right? So uh, that's why I called it phi here. It's phi on every fiber, it's phi E for uh, over every point E, okay? So, and you know that if you restrict this here to any to x cross a point, then it has always this dimension here, always the same dimension. And then there's a theorem that uh, this is a vector bundle here if all the fibers have the same dimension here. Same here. This is also a vector bundle. Okay. So let me write down. This is a vector bundle of rank h zero of e of d for any e. I wrote it down here. And this is a vector bundle of rank uh, H0 of E restricted to D. This is, of course, just the number of, of sections of D. Right? So, so here D goes in, but in the difference, not anymore. Right? That's why D is unimportant, actually. You take here the difference. Right? So and then again, define. Now we can define a structure. B and D K. The locus of those points where phi, the map phi, has uh, the right dimension. Okay. So we define it as the locus of in M, N, where the map phi has rank lesser or equal to H0 of E of D. Maybe I should be a bit, has a rank as rank lesser equal to h0 of e of d minus k. Same way as here, right? Same way as here, right? Well, this is a map, map between vector bundles. So locally, it's given by matrices. So this is a determinantal variety, right? This is what's called a determinantal variety. So we get a structure of a variety here, of a determinantal variety on this Brunetto locus. Right, so I write here this is a determinantal variety. <coughs> uh, 
And, uh, well, and from the theory of determinantal varieties, we know what's the dimension is, right? At least in an in, in, uh, estimate for it. So, this I'm going to use. I will not go into the theory of determinantal varieties here. So, from the theory of determinantal varieties, we get the dimension of every component of this algebraic variety of D, K, and D, and D is greater or equal to the dimension of this uh, of the moduli space, the base, minus, and now here you have the, the dimension of rank of this one here minus uh, minus the rank of phi, right? So we get just uh, k times n times degree d, uh, k times n times degree d minus h zero of e of d minus k. This I use. This is from the theory of the determinant variety. You just have, you know. This is just the same, the, the globalization of this statement here. The rank is lesser equal to this here. You have the moduli space where it works, and you have to subtract this here. Okay? And then you work out what is this. This is, well, the dimension of this I wrote before, of this moduli space. This is n squared times g minus 1 plus 1. Okay? Then we have minus k times, now we have this here, n degree d. Minus, and this H0 we know already, which I uh, erased, unfortunately, but, okay. Uh, did I, or did I not? Ah, uh, oh yeah, here we are. Oh, minus this here. So this is minus uh, D uh, plus N degree D. Degree is delta, degree D is delta, but uh, you can write it because I also wrote it here. Okay, and then minus n times g minus 1, yeah, it's there, plus k. Plus k, why plus k? Because plus k or minus k, let's see. Maybe minus, right? Minus k. Maybe, let's see, why plus, why have I a plus here? Minus k. Minus Sorry? <laughs> Minus appeared already, right? There must be a plus, I think. Okay. So this is this here. And then you see this cancels, so degree d wasn't important at all, right? And you are left with, actually, uh, you are left with n squared times g minus 1 plus 1, which is the dimension of the moduli space, minus k times k minus d, right? plus n times g minus 1. Okay? Plus, in, and also here I had plus, right? I think so, yes. Right. Okay. And this is the Bernoulli number, right? So this is called beta, now ndk, and it's called the Bernoulli number, bn number. For rank 1, you get exactly the Brunner number as before, as you can see. So this is a proof of what I announced before, right? Yeah. Now I guess, yeah, I wanted to do an infinitesimal study. Maybe I, I don't know. Uh, I'll also explain, uh, I, I'll leave it up to you, but then I need a little more, more time. So uh, I think uh, I should stop here, make 10 minutes interval. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No. Um, mm -hmm. Let's have ten, uh, ten minutes. Wait. Thank you.